Today, we, the people of the United States, fighting a desperate rear guard action against the Japs, grimly realize that our future depends upon holding a fighting China as our ally. Well, may we ponder what might happen if China should fall, if the full force of Japan, now deadlocked in China, were released to strike into India, into Australia, into Mexico or Canada, or California. Despite the propaganda, the Allies gave China low priority. They were struggling to survive the war in Europe. General Joseph Stilwell was named the top American commander in China. Stilwell had lived in China and he spoke the language. His job was to keep China in the war and improve its fighting capacity. He commanded Chinese troops, and he believed that, properly trained, they would be among the best in the world. But he railed against the nationalist command. He would speak in expletives to me about the Chinese generalship, uh, because uh, he would find them pig-headed, uh, uh, vacillating, they'd change their mind. Uh, uh, and again, uh, uh, Jiang would not want to commit uh, a large force to uh, gain an objective, he would send it in in driblets, and it would then be consumed by the Japanese in driblets. Stilwell found that the Generalissimo was unwilling to commit his troops against the Japanese because he was saving them for use against the Chinese communists. He had 500,000 of his best troops blockading the area occupied by the Chinese communists. Stilwell soon saw the Chinese war effort was hampered by another problem, corruption. It started at the top with Jiang's inner circle, his wife's family and a handful of his oldest friends. They controlled the economy and made enormous profits from their positions. Jiang himself was never accused of corruption, but he did nothing to stop it, and it spread to all levels in the nationalist government. Those it hurt most were the ordinary soldiers Stilwell was trying to command. Conscripts were treated brutally. They were afraid we would run away, so they would tie five or six men together on the same rope. That's how we traveled. We were strung up in groups. I saw hundreds of our conscripts strung up and pulled along on ropes. At night, to stop them running away, they tied their legs. I saw it with my own eyes. The nationalists had corrupt officers. They put sand in the rice to replace what they had taken. We ate moldy rice with a lot of sand in it. They said we were drafted to fight Japan and defend our homeland. If they really meant it, why didn't they give us food and clothes? Why was there corruption? Poverty. If America didn't have enough food and clothing, corruption would exist there too. As the Chinese saying goes, only before ever reaching their units. One out of every ten men drafted during the war. Stilwell and the Foreign Service officers filed reports about nationalist corruption and other problems to no avail. Nationalist censorship and the American media bolstered Jiang's image. Well known to every American is lean, keen Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, undisputed leader and idol of 450 millions of Chinese. In 1943, Madame Jiang visited the United States and charmed Congress and the public. Let us not forget that Japan in her occupied areas today has greater resources at her command than Germany. Let us not forget that during the first four and a half years of total aggression, China has borne Japan's sadistic fury unaided and alone. She repeatedly requested huge amounts of money and supplies for the government. 
When the U.S. Treasury expressed reservations, Jiang threatened to sign a separate peace with Japan. And so millions of dollars were sent. No one had to account for the money, and much of it simply disappeared. To be fair, I must say that in any government, at any time, there will be situations we don't like. Some unfair and illegal behavior. This can happen in any country, any government, at any time. Especially during a period of bad economic conditions after years of war. Naturally, some people are tempted by material things. In August 1944, a group of American officers flew deep into northwest China to Yunnan. Anxious to improve China's fighting capacity, Stilwell and the American government wanted to know if the communists could be used effectively in the war. The foreign service officers who went to Yunnan were called the Dixie Mission. It was the first official Western recognition of the communists. My first impressions, well, Mao Zedong was a, a large, uh, even then uh, a slightly tending towards plump uh, individual with uh, a very smooth face, no facial hair that had been noticed. Um, and he uh, uh, was not what you would call charismatic. He was straightforward, did not dwell on polite uh, phrases at all, uh, but there was no question that he was the boss. Everyone was deferential to him, including people like Zhou Enlai and Zhu De. They, uh, they looked to him, and when he spoke, no dog barked. Mao was now the undisputed leader of the communists. The year before, Mao Zedong thought had become their official ideology. No criticism of Communist Party policies was tolerated. The communists wanted to create a good impression, for they wanted American help in the immediate struggle against Japan, and they hoped for long-term support when the war was over. The American officers spent a year in Yunnan assessing the communists' organization and their military potential. Apart from a few Russian advisors, they saw no evidence of Soviet support. With full U.S. government approval, the Americans instructed the communists on strategy and weaponry. They watched guerrilla tactics. They traveled out from Yunnan and watched the communists attack Japanese blockhouses. They saw that the communists controlled huge areas in the countryside of north and central China. Patrick Hurley, President Roosevelt's personal representative visited. His mission was to mediate between Jiang and the communists. When uh, Hurley arrived in Yunnan, the, the plane sat down and uh, the door was flung open and there stood Hurley in his major general's uniform, you know, glistening in his white mustachios and his six feet three, and he let out a Choctaw war hoop. And, of course, uh, the, the Chinese were much too courteous to, uh, to stand and say, what goes on, you know? Uh, they just, uh, I suppose they assume that this is the way foreign devils do, uh, behave when they appear upon a scene somewhere. China was a very complex phenomenon, uh, and it really baffled him, I think. He, uh, had great difficulty with identifying who the various Chinese were. Uh, he had, uh, Mao Zedong was Mustang, uh, and the uh, nicknames that grew up there in an attempt to uh, uh, identify people uh, was uh, a very clear indication that he really was somewhat at sea, shall we say. Despite cordial appearances, Hurley's mediation went badly and led to deep communist mistrust of him. 
Hurley supported Chiang Kai-shek and did not seem to take the communists seriously. The foreign service officers made a different assessment. I reported uh, on the communists uh, after my visit there that uh, I thought that they would probably uh, win in China. Uh, and uh, the reason I think that that would happen is that they had uh, popular support. Uh, I mentioned, I think, at the time that, that they were a democratic force. That was a, a, mis uh, that was a misnomer. They were a popular force, and they had a popular support. And only in that sense were they democratic. Relations between Jiang and Stilwell were deteriorating. Stilwell, on behalf of the American government, demanded that Jiang make sweeping changes in his army.